We are continuing. Um, we are starting a new session. And at the beginning uh, of the session, I would like to remember one of Irit's favorite sayings uh, about language. It was that if the structure is at the heart of language, then the variation defines its soul. And in her work, she always pursued uh, language change, which is at the heart of language, both in spoken language like Hebrew and in sign language. Um, we all know that the revival and the development of modern Hebrew uh, is a story full of adventures. It is changing dynamically all the time. There are a lot of changes going on. One of the changes that we are all familiar with is uh, when we count things. For example, a traditional way to count things in Hebrew is to say shlosha sugim. But nowadays, people also say shalosh sugim. Uh, or they do not make any difference between the two forms. And this and similar changes, Irit was uh, studying in Hebrew. But her main goal was not just to catalog changes, but to get to their essence, to understand the driving forces that mo mo motivate the change. Uh, she was talking about the talk of war between simplification and language and its uh, need to be very distinct, very clear. And the same work she devoted to, or similar work she devoted to sign languages, because sign languages, and especially young sign languages like uh, Israeli sign language, is a vast territory of variation and change. Irit studied changes in Israeli sign language all the time. For example, changes in the way deaf people use verbs. Even when people talk about actions between other people, older signers prefer to use their own body as the starting point for the change um, and for the movement. And younger people prefer to dissociate between their own body and the movement and they relate to multiple uh, points in space. And also in Hebrew and in sign language, a redemonstrated and talked about the driving forces of change. In my own work, I was very much inspired of a re by Reed's work. And in my own work, I've been looking at the changes in facial expressions and the use of the body. And we also see changes between younger signers and older signers. Like, for example, when they sign the sentence like, the girl who is swinging is eating ice cream. You will see when you watch this movie, one by the older sign and one by the younger signer, that they use their face differently. The older signer won't use squinted eyes, which is very important for Israeli sign language, and the younger signer is going to use it. Erit was trying to move ahead of time, to follow the direction of change, and also to foresee its further development. In this very session, we're going to follow this path. We're going to meet those who carry out and continue the change. We're going to meet a younger generation of signers, young children who sign. How do young children create the language? Uh, during this session, we'll learn about different aspects of this very complex uh, process. And I'm really privileged to welcome Professor Susan Golden Meadow, 
um, who is professor of psychology and human development at the University of Chicago. She's, she's known all over the world for her research on the communication of small deaf children who were born in hearing families with no access either to sign or to spoken language. She analyzes and researches the language that these children create spontaneously with their own hands and bodies. This work led to Susan's important research on gestures that accompany speech uh, for hearing people, gestures that help us think. So much. So I have been studying, <coughs> excuse me, for close to 50 years, which is an amazing number. Um, deaf children of hearing parents were called home signers. And what I want to do today is to describe to you the story of one of these children because I think it's a story that Arit really would have liked. And the child's name is David. So I first met David when he was three years old, and he is now 50. We've known each other for a very long time. David was born to deaf parents. I'm sorry, he was born deaf to hearing parents. And when we met, he had not been exposed to any sign language and a very few spoken words. So a recent article that was just written about David reported that he was not able to communicate until he was eight years old. But that's not really true. I knew David between three and eight, and he could communicate really well. So here's an example of David when he was about four, telling me in his own way that his uncle had come to visit. What he's doing, he's looking at a picture of a, um, an airport. And he's talking about the planes going up, gesturing about the planes going up. And at some point, he turns to me, and he gestures a, a beard sign and a mustache sign. And I can't figure out what he's talking about. And then eventually, I figure out that he's talking about the fact that his uncle came to visit and came to the airport. You're watching. David was able to tell us pretty well what he wanted to tell us. This is a, an example of David gesturing about shovels. He's looking at the same picture book, but this time he's looking at a picture of a shovel stuck in sand. And what he does is he tells us that shovels, he, he shows the way that shovels can be used. Then he says that you can use shovels. Now he's no longer talking about a sand shovel, but a snow shovel. That it can be used outside when you put on, on boots um, and you keep the shovels downstairs. And it's a whole little story about shovels. Shovel, shovel. So David knew neither signed nor spoken language when I met him. But as you could see, he really could communicate. So children like David are called home signers. And home signers really invent their own language. And those languages have many, although not all, but many of the properties of human language. So let me just illustrate some of those properties. Like all languages, home signs are structured at several different levels of analysis. 
at the level of the sentence, at the level of the word, and at the level of language use. And I'm going to give you an example of each. So in terms of sentences, when David would string sent words together or gestures together, he produced them in a particular order. So here his mother is holding up a little green grape, and she says they're green. He points at the grape, and then he does a gesture for eat. So what David does is he points at the gesture for grape first, and then he does his eat sign. And he does that pretty much whenever he's talking about acting on objects. Notice that in English, one would say, eat the grape, but David says, grape eat. And he's pretty consistent across his entire sign system. In terms of words, what David would do was create words out of, comp out of smaller units. So here's an example where he's talking about putting a penny down. And he gestures the penny and does penny put down all at once, penny put down. And we're teasing him. This is my colleague, Holly, uh, <coughs> Heidi Feldman, and I are teasing him. He gets a little angry. And what he does then is he separates his sign into the round part and the put down part. Okay. So he's sort of breaking up his sign right before our eyes. So what David has done is initially he, put, he produces round put down, and then he breaks it up into round and put down. It's a, a, akin to having morphemic parts to his signs. And then finally, the last little bit, David uses his gestures to talk to himself, just like anybody uses their signs to talk to themselves and hearing people use their words to talk to themselves. What the child does here is he's sitting next to his hearing sister, and he, they're playing with clay. He gets up and he's looking for a plastic knife. And without making contact, eye contact with anybody, he does sort of a where gesture to himself and then points at himself. Again, not looking at anybody. This is clearly communication only for himself. So David also used his gestures to tell stories. This is a story about a bike fall. So he's telling us that he was on his bike, and he fell over, and he went over the handlebars, and he hurt his little chin. And he's pretty good at telling this story. David used his home sign system up until the time that he was about 13. He continued to use it after that. But at age 13, what happened is that his mother learned how to cue, learned cued speech. Now what cued speech is, because so many sounds of, of English and a spoken language are not disambiguous, cannot be disambiguated on the mouth, what this system does is it introduces <coughs> gestures that distinguish sort of an M from an N or a B from a P. It's really hard to use because you're producing speech and at the same time you have to produce these little hand signals that distinguish one sound from another. So what you're going to see here is David sitting in a chair. I'm sorry, it's a very blurry videotape. <laughs> sitting in a chair and his mother is sitting next to him and she's going to cue to him. David himself never learned to cue, but he always he <coughs> used the cues that his mother produced and therefore, I think, understood the, her English pretty well. So here we go.
So in fact, David used everything to communicate, everything he had. He used cues, speech, he used finger spelling, he used gesture. What's <coughs> happening here is um, my late husband is actually talking to David. He's not a signer at all. He can barely finger spell, actually. But he's trying to use finger spelling with David um, to talk to him. He's gesturing. He's a great gesturer. Um, and then we move over to the side to his brother, who's also gesturing. And it's very clear they're getting across this idea of playing squash, which is not a trivial idea to get across to a 13-year-old boy. I'll watch him. In college, it was like tennis and squash. <laughs> you know squash? I, I don't know how to play squash. Okay, so eventually David learned to sign at Gallaudet in 1987. He then graduated from Temple University in 1999. And he delivered the senior address in ASL at the senior class celebration when he graduated. He met his hearing wife, who's a signer at Gallaudet. They married in 1999 and have three children, all of whom are bilingual in ASL and English. He's currently a skilled cabinet maker and an avid father who's the scorekeeper for his son's basketball team. So David's is a story about how far a child can go in inventing a language and how much farther the child can go with a language like American Sign Language and with a very supportive community. So David and other home signers tell us about the first step in emerging language. Irid and I bonded over this question, over our mutual interest in how language emerges. We talked about the properties of language that individuals can and cannot invent on their own and what that tells us about language. We talked in rush conferences, but also while visiting the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, strolling around Boston, and in beautiful places in Italy. It was always enlightening to talk to Irit, who was a clear-headed and thoughtful scholar. But really, the best part was getting to know Irit as a person, kind, generous, always interested in people. I always thought that we could have been really good friends had we lived closer and had we had more time. Thank you very much. It was really a fascinating, very moving talk. And now I'm really happy to invite the presenters of the, of the next talk. Uh, it's going to be a joint talk. And the presenters are Dr. Raman Avogratsky and Ora Ochanin. And really, I'm really ha happy to welcome them because I've been uh, working with them for a few years. Uh, Dr. Raman Avogrodsky is a speech and language therapist, and she's been working with deaf kids as well. She studies language acquisition in diverse populations, such as deaf children, children with language disorder and autism. Her research focuses on the interaction between language acquisition and cognitive development, and how different components of language uh, dissociate and interact. Um, she studies both American Sign Language and Israeli Sign Language acquisition, exploring effects of sign language input, native versus non-native signing, on, dif on different language domains such as vocabulary and syntax. And Ara Hanin, she, is, she, she was born in deaf family and we are fami all familiar with this family. And therefore, Israeli Sign Language is her mother tongue. At the moment, Aura is a media designer, a very talented one. And at the very beginning of the day, we saw the promo movie of the lab that she created. And also, nowadays, she's a student for social sciences at the University of Haifa. Um, She's uh, participating in the um, bilingual bimodal project initiated by Dr. Um, 
Rama Novogrodsky and our dear Eric Meir. In this project, she is responsible for developing the linguistic coding. She's also responsible for recruiting deaf families. She has a lot of responsibility there, but she's enjoying it because she's learning so much about her mother tongue during this project. So the floor is there. Hello everyone, you know me, I'm Ora, my name is Ora, this is my sign name, and this is Dr. Ora Manovogotsky, this is her sign name. We work in the Bye Bye research team, and we came to talk about this Bye Bye, not BB, not the Prime Minister, no, Bye Bye. It's the bi, uh, bilingual, bimodal, two modalities. Now I want to tell you, what are modalities? Young children are signing. They're bilingual because they have two languages, Hebrew and sign language. So two languages, they're bilingual. Now modal, bimodal, what is a modality? It's speech and sign. It's a type of communication. We're looking at children who are signing and acquiring signs from a very, very young age and the gradual uh, process of learning of, of acquiring those signs. This is our team, the Bye Bye team. It has people from very different backgrounds. And we work with speech and language therapists, linguists, and experts in uh, child language uh, acquisition. We have interpreters in our team. We have deaf people in our team native signers. Each person in the team has a different background and they give a lot for the success of the project. This is the basis of our work together and how we develop our process and the tools to assess the idea. <laughs> tools to assess uh, ch child language and we'll go into that in a bit. At first, uh, our four-year-long project uh, was with Irit. <coughs> it was Irit's project. We've, we're adapting Hebrew to sign language uh, assessment tools with great precision. From Hebrew to sign language, and that was Irit who gave us her experience, her linguistic experience, and it was amazing. That was the start of this project. Now, our Bye Bye team, we're looking at a lot of language tests. We have a, long, a lot of language tests. We're focusing today on telling you about one of these language tests. And this is the CDI. Now, what does it stand for? It's a child developmental inventory. It means that a young child, we measure how many signs they sign in each age. How many signs do they sign when they're one, or when they're two, or when they're three years old? And this assessment tool helps us uh, understand more about the language. Now the CDI was built for hearing children. And the hearing parents get a list of printed out words. And it's not done in schools, because we can't get them to tell us everything that the child is saying in an hour. <laughs> the parents are feeling that. The parents are filling out the questionnaire. Now, the CDI originally was in Hebrew in Israel. There wasn't a, 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 a sign language CDI. It's as if, if you go and you look at hearing children, you ask the parents, what words are the child producing? And hear, uh, uh, hearing parents of deaf children, they're not producing the words. The child is not producing the words. They, they produce the signs. So we've adapted this inventory to sign language. Now this is the CDI in Hebrew. We've adapted it to ISL for deaf children, deaf, deaf signing children. They have the CDI in several different languages all around the world. 
CDI has seven different languages, seven different, sorry, sign languages. ASL and German sign language and British sign language and all sorts. And we, we have adapted the Israeli one for Israeli sign language. Out of seven sign languages in the world, we are, uh, we are one of seven and I'm thrilled. The CDI from Hebrew, adapting it into ISL, it was a lot of work. It was very complicated, very thorough, things we didn't even expect. And you might ask, why are we adapting it from Hebrew and not from other sign languages? Because the children live in an environment and they hear certain words, hearing children hear the words that are appropriate for Israel. So, for example, the vocabulary. The vocabulary is not one-to-one. -one, uh, not every sign has a Hebrew meaning, and not every Hebrew word has a sign in ISL. Let me give you an example. This sign for love, in Hebrew, it's one word. But in ISL, you have two. As in English, you have love and like. A child says, I love um, a person or a character. But if you say, I like playing in, with this toy, it's a different sign. That's love and that's like. And in Hebrew, that's one word in the Hebrew CDI. The parents who fill this out, they only say anything if the... Hold on, we have a problem with the microphone, I guess. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, let me repeat now. Everybody can hear? Good. So it was very important for us to stress to the parents, only sign it not when the children are pointing to things. Let's say ear or nose. They can point to it, but it's very important to uh, differentiate. Or if they're pointing to the television's head or to the computer, we only want to know signs they are signing, they are producing the signs. So we took out everything that in sign language could be used as a pointing sign. Face, we didn't, took out, we didn't take out the, uh, the sign for face. Because you don't point to your face, you, you have a, a path of your finger. But we took out several different signs that were not suitable for the CDI for the ISL CDI. We ended up with many, many words, nearly 600 words. Signs, sorry. So, I'm a research assistant, and Anne-Marie, who's another research assistant, she's fluent in ASL, she's from America. We've been working together, going all over Israel, visiting families who have uh, young children signing from the age of one till six the use sign language at home. It was all over Israel. We didn't meet one family. We went to the south, to the north, to everywhere in Israel. We visited families and collected the data. And we've collected 39 families, data from 39 families over two years. It's 0.3% of the entire deaf population in Israel. That's a lot. That's really a good number. So what was important for us when we went to visit them is to go to their homes, to the natural environment, where they feel free and comfortable signing. If we go to school, they don't, feel, uh, they don't express themselves as naturally as they do at home. That was really important for us. So this is us, me and Anne-Marie. We would go to uh, children's houses, and what would we do? We would sit with them. We would sign with them. We would play with them, play with Lego and have a little conversation to warm up, to get to know me. And then we would do all sorts of tasks with them, like reading a, a book, retelling a book, or all sorts, uh, or watching a video, and then retell the story they saw on the video. And our aim was to uh, get these children to sign. And then we can, and everything was videotaped, and then, then we can, uh, analyze this data. 
It was an hour long meeting with two cameras. And uh, the same day or sometimes the day uh, after or a few days later, these parents would sit down with a list of, of with a questionnaire, parental questionnaire and the CDI questionnaire. Now the parental questionnaire was background questions about the child, about their uh, environment, about the language status. We want to know from the parents. And then there's a CDI. This is the ISL CDI. Instead of a li very long list of written words, we have uh, videos. So the parents fill it out. If the child is producing this sign, they tick yes. If they're not, they're, produce, they're ticking no. It's a very long process. And some of the children, we met them once, and some of the children, we met twice. We went back to the same family six months later. And in this interval, we wanted to see the development. It was very, very interesting. Now, after we've met the children and after the parents filled out everything they had to, it wasn't about the uh, parents and the children <coughs> to get to meet each other and to meet the other people. We gave uh, these questionnaires to uh, other questionnaires to deaf people, other deaf people. I'm sure some of you have done it. It's the frequency questionnaire. We measure how frequent is this sign in Israel, in ISL. If a sign is very, very rare, you see it once every so-and-so, or very common, like bye-bye. Everybody is signing goodbye. Or staircase. Do you sign staircase every day? No, oh, you do occasionally. How common are the signs? This is what we wanted to know from old native signs. <coughs> and the second questionnaire is iconicity. Iconicity. Now, what is iconicity? How much uh, this sign sh looks like what it represents. A rabbit looks like a... Uh, the sign for rabbit looks like a rabbit, but the sign for father, does it look like a person, like a father? Less, right? So this is iconicity. So the prevalent... The, the iconicity and how common the signs are, it affects how young children acquire it and how soon they acquire the sign. Because if a sign is very common and very iconic, they acquire it earlier. And now, our findings. Over to Amma. I will speak slower because my English is not my native language. So you've seen a native signer, now you're going to hear a non-native English speaker. So compare the two communication modes. <laughs> it's going to be slower for both languages and easier for the interpreters, I'm assuming. Okay, so the first finding I would like to share with you is related to something the parents uh, reported for us. Um, I would like to uh, uh, first uh, look at the uh, circle on the, um, on the right side, and as you will see, the uh, orange color represent um, the number of children who were exposed to ISL in their education setting, setting at school. And we were surprised and happy that half of our participants were exposed to ISL during their education. Uh, hour during the time they were uh, sp in the time they were spending in the education setting. Furthermore, look at the circle on the left side. Uh, sorry, on the right side. I confused. On the right side, you will see the red color. Half of our participants were exposed not only to ISL but to ISL from a native ISL signer uh, in their education system. So, at least to our eyes, this is a, a positive. Uh, findings with um, regards to the population we are um, exploring or we are um, reporting on children who are uh, native signers. 
Now to the findings um, that present um, the um, vocabulary size of the children we tested. The X, um, the X X's, X uh, represent age. As, an, as you can see, it starts from zero to 80 months, and it's in month. And uh, the Y X's represent the number of words children were produced. You can see that with age, children produced more signs, uh, suggesting that the tool we developed is a reliable language assessment tool. But furthermore, or importantly, we also tested a group of older children. These are the uh, dots you see at the right side of the figure. And all of these children, aged five to six years old, were children um, who scored almost at ceiling. They scored, they knew, and used almost all the, all the 600 signs that are in the CDI questionnaire. This means to us that these signs are really part of the vocabulary and the language that preschoolers who are signing are using. So this is another important finding. With regards to iconicity and uh, frequency, it was interesting to find that the results, or the results were a little bit complex. As you see, these, uh, this is an example of six signs that uh, children used in their early um, signing. Bye-bye, um, mother, father, light, water, and sleep. There are more, but we just gave here an example of six first signs. You can see that some of these signs are very frequent and very iconic. Look at the uh, sign for light. Um, the, iconic, the frequency um, score is 5.3 on a, on a scale of 1 to 7, and the iconicity uh, score is 6.5, which is um, very high. But there were also some signs who were frequent, for example, the sign like mother, but were not iconic. You see the uh, sign for mother and for father uh, uh, received uh, low scores in iconicity. Mother and father are not iconic signs. Still, these were uh, some of the very first signs children are using. Uh, and we found that, um, I will just walk you quickly through um, this figure. Um, we found that on, on the right side you see the effect of frequency across the different ages. This is uh, just illustration, a visual illustration of our results, and the different bands that you see represent different age um, range of the children in our group. And we saw that across all age ranges, frequency affected uh, acquisition. So signs that were more frequent were used more by children. However, with iconicity, the picture was more complex. You see that the three lower bands on the left uh, figure, these represent the younger age group. And at this age group, there is no effect of iconicity. Iconicity actually, according to our finding, come into play only by the age of 24 months, by the age of two years. So at the age of two years, uh, the effect of iconicity was shown in the group of our participants. So to summarize our findings, uh, we developed a CDI questionnaire in ISL. We showed that with age, children gain more signs and they're using more signs in their vocabulary. And we showed, similarly to other sign languages and spoken languages, that both iconicity and frequency play a role in, iconic sorry, in acquisition, but in a complex way. Thank you. <laughs> Rama and Aura, thank you very much for the talk. And now I would like to introduce the next joint talk presented by Professor Nama Friedman and Doran Levy. Um, Doran Levy and Professor Nama Friedman are going to give the next talk simultaneously in Israeli Sign Language and in English. Um, as you will see in this talk, Dorian and Nama are working uh, on the development of assessment for language difficulties in Israeli Sign Language and on language impairments in sign languages in the framework of the Sign Hub project um, that we introduced at the beginning of the day. Uh, and this project connects researchers in a large number of countries. 
Uh, Darren Levy is a PhD student working on assessment of language impairments in Israeli Sign Language. And Israeli Sign Language is uh, his native language. And I owe special credits and special thanks to Darren who actually introduced me to Israeli Sign Language when, many, many years ago when I was just starting to be a research assistant in the lab and he was a consultant here. Really, thank you so very much. Nama is the head of the Language and Brain Lab, starting acquired uh, language acquisition um, and developmental language impairments. Hello everybody, we're very happy to be speaking to you today. Uh, what we are going to talk about today is why it is very, very important to sign from birth. And uh, this is a, work, a teamwork. As you can see here in the team, there is Doron Levy, uh, Lilach Peer, who is a speech therapist, Neta Chalutz, who's sitting here, and me. And we have a new addition to the group, Mo, who is uh, doing research with us. And it's a pleasure to, to do this work together with people who are speech therapists and uh, researchers of various kinds. And what is the issue that we want to talk about today? The issue is the following. <coughs> if a child who is a signer experiences problems in language, if, how do we assess them? How do we know what the problem exactly is in order to help them? If a person arrives in the hospital after a stroke, who, he is a signer, and we want to know what exactly the problem is, how do we do it? Nowadays, the problem is that there are no tools for assessment of language, uh, language disorders in uh, ISL, uh, and they are tested in Hebrew or in Arabic. So what we, were, we are doing in our lab is developing tools to assess syntax, word order and sentence structures, <coughs> to assess lexical retrieval, whether a person knows a word, but whether they are able to retrieve the words from their lexicons, phonological working memory, and also reading of finger spelling. And today we focus on syntax. So this is what we are going to talk about. What we currently know from a lot of work in various lang spoken languages about deaf and hard of hearing people who did not receive uh, language, either sign language or uh, cochlear implants or uh, hearing uh, aids until the age of one year, they experience problems in uh, syntax in spoken languages. Now the question is, what about, sorry, what about deaf people who are signers from birth? How is their uh, syntax? So we are going to show the syntax of people who sign from birth, and then we are going to show you a person with uh, language impairment in sign language. And we are going to start very quickly by showing what is known about uh, people who are deaf and hard of hearing, who received hearing aids late, so they did not, were not exposed to spoken language during the first year of life. And what happens to their syntax? So we'll start by giving you two examples. These are uh, people that we show them this picture and ask, which dog does the cat bite? And this is what they would answer. Hmm, that's hard. This one, pointing to the left one. Right, no, this one, pointing to the other one. Say it again, and I say it again, and they say, how? They don't say. So they are not able to know which one is the right bird, uh, dog to point at. Now you can see, <laughs> now you can see why this, uh, this sentence is so complex. When we say something like, which dog does the cat bite? We have a very complex order. Usually the cat bites the dog, or the dog bites the cat. But here we have a dog that the cat bite. And this strange order is called a sentence with movement. 
Another example, this time from a sentence repetition task. We ask people to, who are deaf and hard of hearing, who are wearing their uh, cochlear implants or their uh, uh, hearing devices, to repeat sentences. So for example, we ask them to repeat a sentence like, which teacher does the boy like? And they say, which boy, which he likes? He likes teacher, which he likes teacher? So you see that it's very difficult for them to understand and then produce these sentences. We see the same happening with a different type of structure, like this teacher, the girl front. You see that it's exactly the same kind of difficulty. <coughs> the same kind of difficulty. These difficult sentences are sentences that include syntactic movement. So the order of the words in the sentence are not the usual ones. It's not the subject and then the verb and then the object, but something has changed. And this is what we call movement, syntactic movement. And it's called WH movement because this is the kind of movement that happens in WH questions. Questions like who, what. So if the basic sentence is the girl drew the, which, this woman, the movement will be which woman the girl, exactly as Uti does, that. This is what happens in the sentence. And there are different kinds of structures that have this kind of movement, that we take something from the end and move it to the beginning. And just to give you the, the, names, of these, the names of these structures, the first one is called topicalization. It's used very often in ISL, but also in spoken languages. Topicalization, uh, relative clauses, sentences like, this is the woman that the girl draws. And WH questions like, which woman does the girl draw? Now, what do we find in uh, uh, children who are deaf and hard of hearing, and they are only exposed to oral language? They do not receive sign languages. How is their uh, language? So this is a study done with uh, Ronit Sterman and Manar Hadad Khanna in Hebrew and in Palestinian Arabic, with, as you see, many uh, participants. And these are individuals who did not receive any sign language, and they are deaf from birth. <laughs> And what do we find? What you see here are different tests, okay? And we compare the orange columns, which are the uh, children who did not receive enough language input during the first year, so they did not have any language during the first year of life. And they are compared to children who, didn't, who did receive uh, cochlear implants or hearing aids during the first year. And you see that for many, many different kinds of tasks, comprehension and production, repetition, different kinds of syntactic structures, the children who did not receive language exposure early enough have severe difficulties in syntax, in movement. So what does it mean? It means that it is crucial to give a child exposure to language during the first year of life. Now here we talk about exposure to spoken language. Now the question is, what happens with people who have, who receive sign language? Okay, so until now we only talked about orally trained people who receive only spoken languages. What about children who receive uh, sign language from birth? So first, very few things about the syntax of Israeli sign language. We start with the fact that Israeli sign language is a <coughs> subject, verb, object language, and it includes movement. Like any other natural language, it includes movement. Where do we find movement in Israeli sign language? First of all, we have structures with topicalization. For example, car, daddy, wash. Daddy, wash the car, this is Hebrew. So you see movement of the car to the beginning of the sentence. Another type of movement that we see is in questions, who, what, etc. And here uh, as well you can see movement. For example, you see who in the beginning and in the end. And also in question in yes no questions. Right? You deaf you? You deaf you? 
You see the, the you in the beginning and in the end? This is movement. So we have you deaf you and we, we have who kiss girl who. And now we're going to test these structures in children who children and adults who speak sign language, Israeli sign language. And we, we, we use different kinds of syntactic tasks. We test comprehension, we test production, we test repetition, and we test, test structures that involve this kind of syntactic movement. <coughs> and for each kind of task, we ask, ask whether uh, these individuals who sign from birth are able to produce and understand sentences with movement similarly to sentences without movement. Our participants were 26 native signers of ISL, 14 adults and 12 children. And this is our chance to tell you thank you very much. Many of you participated in our task, so thank you. Thanks a lot. And now you see why you participate in the task. The idea is to create, to collect in, uh, information about how native signers sign and to show how important it is to sign. Okay, so the first task is testing comprehension of questions in ISL. We tested 80 sentences with uh, uh, questions. We see a video of Doron signing a question. And then the participant has to point to the right figure in the picture. So what did we compare? First of all, we compared subject questions with and without reduplication. Remember that when we have reduplication, so we have the who in the beginning and in the end, this is a structure with movement. <laughs> so if we ask who bite cat who, we have movement, right? And we compare it to structures without movement like who bite cat. And what do we see? We see that people who sign from birth are great with movement. They don't have any problem with structures with movement. They do well with move structures with movement just like they do in structures without movement. Another kind of structure that we tested was subject questions and object questions. For example, dog, bite, cat, dog witch. You see there is a movement, the dog in the beginning and in the end, right? And we compared it to a question like dog bite cat, which we didn't. They're good. <laughs> so what do we see exactly as you point correctly here? This is exactly what we also see in the study. We see that native signers are able to understand sentences with movement. They are good in the sentences with movement, just like they are good with sentences without movement. Now another structure that we test. Now we test what? Pseudoclef sentences. These are questions that look, sentences that, that look like a question and an answer, and we call it pseudoclef. So for example, we test sentences. I bunny, dress me, who? Teddy bear, okay? This is a complex sentence that includes movement. Dress me. And we show the picture and we compare it to sentences without movement I bunny, I dress, who? <laughs> I bunny, I dress, who? Teddy bear. It was the teddy bear that I dressed. And what do we find? You see, it's complex sentences. And still, <laughs> yeah. Even though these are complex sentences, signers from birth succeed. They understand both the structures with movement and the structures 
without movement. Now we test production, the production of WH questions. How do we fish WH questions from native signers? <coughs> so we have, a, we have a task. We show them uh, two figures. One of the figures is hidden. And we ask them to ask us a question. If they ask us a question, ask me the question. And if they ask us, we show them. Okay? And we can do it both for girl, wash, accusative, who? And we can also do it for subject questions. If, who wash girl? Who wash girl? Who? And we show them who shows the, who wash this girl. Okay. So this is production of uh, WH questions. What do we find? Again, even though these are structures that involve WH movement. People who sign from birth succeed in signing them. And we see different kinds of productions. We see different types of uh, productions. Sometimes they, say they use constructed action. Sometimes they use the reduplication of the WH element. Sometimes they even use structures, especially the children in school, use structures from Hebrew. But still we see evidence for each and every one of them for using movement. Uh, they also use passive, which was a bit surprising for us, but they do. And this is, again, might be the effect of Hebrew. So what do we see here? We see that we, we saw before that there is a critical period for language acquisition. We see that if people receive sign language from birth, this is crucial for the development of syntax. And if they get, get sign language from birth, then they are able to understand and produce structures with movement. Now, a, a, short, uh, a short point about Hebrew. As we said before, these people are sometimes diagnosed using Hebrew tests or Arabic tests. So they are signers, their native language is sign language, but still they are tested in Hebrew or in, in Arabic. What happens to these exactly the same people who are, or the same children who are tested in sign language and they are great, and then they are tested in Hebrew? So when they are tested in Hebrew, some of them are fine. They are fine in structures with movement. But some of them are not very good. But they are not very good not only in structures of movement which means that it's not a syntactic deficit. It is a problem because it's their second language. So imagine your children would be tested in their second or third language. This is what you see. They are not great, but they do not have a deficit in movement. So some of them are, are very, very good, and some of them are not very good, but they are just performing like a second language. OK, now we get to the last part of our talk. And this is how does a language impairment look like in ISL. So we know from a lot of research uh, that, sign, uh, that uh, specific language impairments exist in spoken languages. A lot of beautiful work that Amano Vygotsky here has been doing. We see that the, the individuals who have problems in syntax from birth have problems with syntactic movement. Now the question is, what, how does language impairment, syntactic impairment in ISL, looks like. So what we did was using the tests that we created before that I showed you to test individ an individual who has problems in language. It's in ISL. Now we'll tell you about Sally. Sally is a deaf from birth. She comes from a deaf family. Uh, she never used hearing aids. And she found it very difficult in high school. And now we know why, because she had language problems. What did we use? The same tasks that we presented to you before. Comprehension, production, and repetition of structures with movement. And we tested structures that involve movement, just like the ones that we showed you before. And what do we see? 
for the comprehension of questions. Remember, we compared sent, uh, questions with reduplications and without re reduplication. Who bite cat who versus who bite cat. And what do we see? Here we see a very, very clear difference between the participant who had a, a language impairment and the native signers. So the orange is the participant with language impairment, and the purple are the native signers. And what you can see is a huge difference in the structure that involves movement. But in the structure without movement, she's like the others. Also, when we compare subject questions and object questions, only one of them has movement. Again, we see exactly the same story. Sally had a significant difficulty with the structure with movement, but she was fine in the structure without movement. So what we see is that she failed exactly in the structure that involves movement, and she didn't have a general problem in language. She has a deficit that is very similar to what we see in uh, spoken languages in uh, language impairment. What about the comprehension of pseudoclefts? Like, uh, I'm bunny, I'm bunny, dress me, <laughs> who, teddy bear? We see exactly the same impairment. So impairment in structures that involve movement and success in structures that do not involve movement. What about the production of WH questions? Here, too, we see difficulties in the production of WH questions. Uh, just to give you an... And finally, when we test repetition of structures with movement and without movement, what we see is difficulties in repetition of structures they find, she finds it very difficult to repeat sentences with movement and she makes structural errors, so syntactic errors. So just to give you one example, when she, she was asked to repeat the sentence, men, he married he, she couldn't repeat it and she said, men index, wife his. Okay, so you see that it's very difficult for her to repeat. So we summarize. First of all, ISL is a natural language like any language. So we see exactly the same pattern. We see exactly the same pattern of impairment both in sign language and in, uh, and it's in spoken language. And we see that language input during the first year of life is crucial. It could be uh, spoken language, but it could be sign language. And native signers who receive sign language from birth are able to develop good syntax. So sign language, Israeli sign language, is a natural language, and it opens the critical period and allows the acquisition of good uh, syntax and good language. Thank you.